Sorry, uh, I'll introduce myself. Okay. Hi, so, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I don't think I've had any one of you in any of my classes, so it's good to meet most of you. My name is Adam Bergasser. I'm a professor here uh, at UCSD, associate professor here at UCSD. Uh, I was also an undergraduate here uh, in the previous millennium, uh, so I have a slight inkling of what it's like to be in your shoes right now. Um, and I'm also an astrophysicist, so I'm in the same group that uh, Professor Murphy's in. Uh, on, I will be talking today about the research that I do here at UCSD, which is on uh, these objects called brown dwarfs. Who's heard of brown dwarfs before, by the way? Pretty good number of you. So when I was an undergrad, nobody had heard of brown dwarfs because they didn't exist yet. So, uh, oh, I think they probably did. Not when I was an undergrad. That was an idea. Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're right. They existed. <laughs> totally right. You got me on that one. They existed. We didn't know where they were. So uh, this is going to be the story of that sort of process of basically when I was undergrad till now, uh, the sort of story of brown dwarfs. But it's not just about me. It's about brown dwarfs. Um, uh, and so I'm uh, the head of uh, this group over at TAS, the Cool Star Lab. Uh, this is some of the students that work with me, both graduate students and undergraduates. Um, and what we focus on uh, is observational studies of the coolest stars uh, things that are brown dwarfs, which we'll talk about in a minute, and also planets around other stars, things that we call exoplanets. In its observation, we actually go to telescopes to take our data. So here's a picture of the top of Mauna Kea, uh, which hosts two of the telescopes that I use frequently. Uh, these are the Keck telescopes. They're two of the largest telescopes in the world. No longer the largest, but two of the largest. Um, we own about 50% of this, so I'm not sure if it's half this and half that or, or some share between. Um, this telescope right here, this little guy, looks like he's not as important as the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility. Uh, that actually is a really useful telescope because it is very sensitive to infrared light. And as I'll talk about in my talk, that's where I do almost all of my science. And I'll mention that I'm actually going to be on that tonight. In fact, I've got flats running right now on the telescope as I'm talking, which you know, multi multitasking. And can I just point yeah. out that I just carried plates across campus that are going on the four of those? So these guys places. and Gemini? Yeah, and Super. And Subaru down here, yeah, Japanese telescope. Right. So lots of great telescopes up in, in uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, which means we occasionally get to go to Hawaii, which is a great, great deal. Uh, here's another pair of telescopes I use. For some reason, all telescopes I use come in pairs. Uh, this is the Magellan telescopes down in Chile, in Las Campanas, Chile. Anybody know their Spanish, what Campanas means? Oh, oh caught you. <laughs> Bells, yeah, excellent. So the, the rocks that are on this, this, um, on this mountaintop are, are infused with copper. It's a very copper-rich mountain. In fact, most of what Chileans do uh, in this part of the region is mine. So there's all these mining uh, holes all over the place. Even some going back like hundreds and hundreds of years, there's holes around the place. If you ding on these rocks, they actually sound like bells because they have so much metal in them. So that's why it's called Las Planas. Um, but it's also a great site to observe um, because just like Mauna Kea, it's a high place right next to the ocean, so you have very stable airflow. Uh, you can get very clear nights, unlike what we've been having here, uh, and um, get lots of data. So, uh, so part of my job is to travel as an astronomer, observational astronomer. If you ever want to travel and not get paid a lot to do it, all right, observational astronomy. <laughs> um, we also use space telescopes. We didn't get to go to travel them to them as much, but uh, we get to use them. Uh, many of you probably know the Hubble Space Telescope, which was recently destroyed in the movie Gravity. Uh, and the uh, Spitzer Space Telescope here, which survived, uh, is actually in orbit around the sun, not the moon. Uh, it's also an infrared, uh, uh, infrared facility. Um, and uh, one of the reasons it's in orbit around the sun and not the Earth is because uh, it's much colder if you get away from the Earth. It's much, and Earth turns out to be a very warm object, uh, as we all are, about 300 Kelvin, which is a big source of infrared radiation. So in order to get away from that, uh, we've actually put the satellite out into space, all right, into orbit around the sun. It's actually about a one astronomical unit around uh, the orbit uh, of the Earth away from us. So it's actually getting quite far. Uh, and I think probably in like 15 or 20 years, we won't be able to communicate with it effectively because we'll get interference from the sun in a way. Uh, but we can still use it now. So I bring all these pictures up just to give you an idea of the kind of tools uh, that I, as an observational astronomer, use to, to study, uh, the, study the objects that I study. Uh, and, um, and, you know, it's actually kind of fun little travel voucher as well. All right, so uh, the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the actual topic I study, which are brown dwarfs. Uh, as some of you have heard about them, but uh, you might not know why they're important, why we actually care about studying these little objects, what they look like. Uh, and so I hope to uh, at least instill a little bit of that uh, in you today. So um, I think the way that these objects 
really came about is if you think kind of going back thousands of years, right, and you're looking up in the night sky, uh, there's kind of two types of little points of light out there. There are the little points of light that don't move, right? They move a little bit night to night because Earth is going around its orbit. You don't know that thousands of years ago, but, you know, they, they move a little bit. But mostly they stay fixed in sort of their configurations. And so these are the constellations. These are the things they can use to keep track of time, uh, to keep track of where you are on Earth, right? Latitude, you know, which way to go east, west, north, south. Um, they're the sort of nice fixed reference frame. Uh, and, you know, really made possible the age of exploration, uh, settling of islands, stuff like that, all sorts of things. And then there are the, the few little bright things that don't stay where they're supposed to. All right, these are the wandering stars, uh, or what the Greeks would call planetai, uh, the things that sort of change their position over time. And, of course, much of uh, physics is uh, derived from trying to understand why those little points of light did what they did. So if you think about uh, Kepler's laws or Newton's law of gravity, or even Newton's laws of motion, they all sort of originate in some way of trying to understand why those few little points of light are changing their position. Our, our, our perspective of the Earth not being in the center of the universe but around the sun, all of this came about is trying to understand how those things actually move. Um, but, you know, they're still different, right? So there's the moving things and there's the stationary things, and that's kind of how we divided up at least the points of light in the sky uh, for literally thousands and thousands of years. In fact, thousands of years up until about 20 years ago. That was sort of the distinction between planets and stars. They were two different objects. But, you know, in astronomy, we always, when we look around, we always find that our perceptions of how we divide stuff into boxes will change. And so the question is, is there anything that's really between stars and planets? Are they really that distinct from each other? Well, we have a lot of other reasons why we think they're distinct. If you just look at sizes, so here's a very scientifically uh, accurate production of the size of the sun and the planets. Um, but, you know, the planets, the biggest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, is about a tenth of the size of the sun. And the sun itself is not that particularly big of a star, all right? Somewhere kind of in the middle, uh, at least in times of a logarithm scale, the middle of the size of stars. There are stars that are uh, ten times, hundred times, thousand times larger uh, than our sun. Uh, and so Jupiter is pretty puny compared to that. And, of course, these little tiny crumbs of rocks that we happen to live on, or at least one of them that we happen to live on, uh, is, are even smaller than that. Tenth the size of Jupiter, hundredth the size of the sun. Very, very tiny things. All right. So, you know, you can distinguish planets from stars by saying planets are tiny and stars are big. All right, that makes sense. Uh, another thing we know uh, is that, at least, I should say up until recently, the way we thought that stars and planets formed uh, was also very distinct. So this is a picture taken of a, by the Hubble Space Telescope of uh, the Eagle Nebula. How many, how many of you have seen this picture before? It's a very famous picture. So this is taken back in 1995, very early on, uh, when uh, Hubble was, I, I think this was before or after. Was it before or after the correction? Exactly. After the correction, okay. So Hubble was kind of screwed up when it first got out there, and then it fixed it. Um, but it is a beautiful picture of, of these sort of clouds of dust and gas uh, that make up this nebula. I should say this is uh, kind of an enhanced photo in the sense that the, the filters in which uh, they took this picture through were very narrow band filters that sampled only emission lines. And so as you can imagine, there's only certain places where that emission line will show up. You'll get a lot of contrast in your image so instead of just like a lot of diffuse light. And so if you looked at this region with your eye, you would just see kind of a diffuse haze. You have to look at these very sharp filters to make out this kind of uh, strong contrast structure. Uh, but these things are huge, right? So at the distance that the, ne the, uh, the Eagle Nebula is at, uh, this structure alone is something like seven light years in across. And uh, how many of you know the distance to the nearest star? Yeah. About four light years, yeah. So this is twice that distance, right? So there's the sun, there's Alpha Centauri, there's a bunch of other things around there. That's one of these structures. So these are humongous things, right? But we think these are the things that uh, stars themselves form out of. In fact, if you look really closely, there's sort of this red spot right here uh, where there's a very deeply embedded star that's just starting to form inside that stuff. This is the creation stuff. This is the, the birthplaces of stars. Uh, and we have this sort of cartoon picture of what happens after uh, this phase. And so here's that big glob that I just showed you in this very you know, accurate representation. Um, Gravity pulls some, some mysteriously, some clumps get a little denser than others, and gravity pulls the rest of the stuff in, so you get this sort of collapsing core. But it's rotating very slowly, and as you shrink down this big, very slowly rotating thing, it speeds up much faster. And so the stuff that's in the plane of rotation can't quite make it in because of because uh, most of the gravity is providing centripetal acceleration. So you end up with this disk of material around this little forming star. Uh, and it turns out we also, as the stuff comes in, magnetic fields kind of throw stuff out along the poles where it's easiest to throw things out. 
these are called jets, uh, and that clears out some of the material that's coming in. Uh, and eventually, you sort of uh, uh, cut off most of this cloud. This is now about 100,000 years after this point. Uh, that stuff starts to evaporate away, and out of this disk of material that was there, that's where the planets come out. Right? So these are kind of the leftover remains of this whole process to form a star. Right? If there was no you know, conservation of momentum, we'd have no planets. Right? This is where these planets come out of. Now, just to give an illustration, we actually know this picture very well because we have pictures, literally pictures, out in space of all of these different phases. Snapshots of how stars form in different environments, um, but sort of sampling this time range. So here's the tip of that cloud they show you with this very embedded uh, red thing inside of it that we can't see. All right, here's a, now a sort of a clump of material, uh, which is still pretty dense, so we can't see it entirely, but there's something certainly forming there. It's starting to pull in. Uh, here is uh, this phase where you've got these jets of material coming out. Looks like you've got like the Death Star ray coming out. These are called Herbig Harrow objects. Uh, George Herbig, who was the co-discoverer of, of these things about 50 years ago, uh, just recently passed away. Um, but for a long time, no one really knew what the heck this was. It maybe was a laser beam from ancient civilization. But uh, what's really happening is that the disk of stuff that's around it is obscuring the star, and you're only seeing the reflection from the inside of the disk. That's why you get these sort of conical sections right here. Yeah? Can you say why the disks are rotating again? Well, so um, our galaxy is rotating. Right? And so if you're in two parts of the galaxy, there's a slight differential rotation. Right? And so uh, over time, you just sort of impart a little bit of, of small amounts of rotation. Um, and uh, even if it's just random movements, eventually if you collapse some part down, any of sort of just slight differential motion will turn into a very fast rotation rate. Yeah. OK, so, uh, so disks, this starts clearing out. There's now a thin disk. And here is a picture of a planetary system. Uh, not too unlike ours, a little bit unlike ours, because they're actually pretty big planets, but, but these are four planets orbiting a star called HR8799, all in the same direction, all sort of in this uh, sort of disk orientation. And the connection between disks and planets is actually very well secure, because we even have pictures of systems like this. This is Beta Pictoris. Um, I should say the star is right here, uh, but the instrumentation used to study the system has actually blocked out uh, a huge fraction of the light of the star, because you can imagine star, as I mentioned before, stars are very, very bright and big. Planets are really tiny. So in order to actually see the planets, you have to block out almost all of the starlight. And so uh, the instrument that's used for this, which is a coronagraph, uh, blocks out the light of the star. And you can just see this faint little speck, uh, which uh, about, uh, I think about a year later, popped over here. And so it appears to be an orbit. And it appears to be an orbit that is aligned with all of this material, which is the disk of the of material around the star, which is still just forming. So we've got beautiful now evidence that this picture that you know you form a star and out of the debris of the star you form planets uh, seems to be at least reasonably true as far as we know from these systems. Okay. And there's a picture of the HR79 system again. So one so that's another way we can differentiate stars and planets. All right. Stars form out of these big clouds and planets are sort of the secondary uh, things that form out of the star formation process. And you can even take that even further. The moons around Jupiter also show this sort of disk structure in their orbits and they all go in the same direction. And we think that Jupiter itself also had a disk of material around it. And out of that material, the larger moons around Jupiter also formed. Right? Saturn has this beautiful ring of material around it. Uh, there's all this sort of, you know, sort of symmetry going down in scale as we go to smaller objects. Now, another reason that stars and planets are different uh, is, you, is stars shine. Right? That's their, their main job. They produce light. Right? If the sun was not shining, we would not be happy today. Right? We get a little sunlight today. It's nice. Um, but they form light, of course, because they, they literally form this radiant energy themselves. Now, they, they don't create energy, because as physicists, we know that's not possible. But they transform mass energy through fusion into radiant energy. And that's the radiant energy that we see, uh, not just from the sun, but from all the stars in the sky. And literally, all of the galaxies that all the astronomers study, what we're really looking at, ultimately, is just starlight. Right? So stars are you know, crucial for the study of astronomy, because if stars did not light up, we wouldn't have observational astronomy. We have nothing to look at. Um, and so that's a pretty important part of stars. Of course, planets, particularly planets in our own system, when we look at them, all right, we look up at Jupiter or Mars or Venus, uh, we don't see them glowing on their own. What we see is just a mirror. All right? We see the reflection of sunlight back at us uh, from the surfaces of these planets. And so particularly some planets, uh, some, some asteroids, some moons are very, very dark. So they don't, they don't reflect a lot of light. They're hard to see. 
Uh, and some plants like the earth, which have this uh, sort of nice cloud layer and, and nice water on it, uh, are very reflective, and so we can see uh, see it very well from space. All right. So again, another difference between stars uh, and planets. Stars, you know, emit light, create light, uh, and planets just reflect it. I'll, I'll point out yeah. the moon only reflects about 10% of the light that hits it, so it's kind of pretty dark gray. I mean, you look at it up in the sky, it's bright because it's the only thing up there, but you know, dark otherwise. But it's, that picture shows it pretty well. Yeah. It's kind of a, a dull, dark object. Yeah. I wish I, I wish I, you could ask a question because I, uh, if, has anyone ever seen a moonbow? Have we seen a rainbow? All right, so moonbow is a rainbow made from the moonlight, uh, and uh, obviously you don't see this much during the daytime. Uh, but if you're like me and you're observing many nights, and often it's cloudy, that happens. Uh, the moon can create a rainbow uh, from water droplets, just like the sun. And if you take a long exposure of that moonbow, it looks exactly like a rainbow because it's sunlight. Right, and it's the same colors. It looks very dim and to us. If you just look at your eyes, it looks kind of this sort of like velvety, paley thing. Um, but that's just the sensitivity of our eyes, our color receptors in our eyes. If you take a long exposure, it's a rainbow. It just happens to be a rainbow created by the moon. So thanks for bringing that up. All right. Um, now, how do the stars get this? You know, how do stars uh, are they? How are they able to do this? Of course, as as physicists, you I'm sure you know the answer is that they fuse hydrogen into helium. All right, they can do that because it gets about 15 million degrees in the core of the stud. Uh, this is not a measurement, I should mention. All right, it's very hard to make measurements of the insides of stars. You can imagine, hard to get funding for that. Um, uh, we can infer this temperature primarily from a model of the sun that we've created. It's very successful for predicting sort of the size and the oscillations of its surface. Uh, and based on that, we can tell that it's, it's about 15 million degrees. We can also tell that it's fusing because we actually see the products of those fusion directly. Anybody know what those products are? Yeah. New, what is it? Well, so uh, deuterium, deuterium is is created as part of the fusion, but we can't we can't go in there and measure it, right? Anybody know what we see? Yeah. Everything iron, right? Everything about iron. Well, so that so we'll. Well, it's actually not. We'll talk about that in a second. But we can, again, we can't go in there and see it, right? We can't go. Yeah, you get iron in there. Okay. How do we see what's going on inside the sun? Yeah. No, not quite. Um, the, the, the lines, the spectral lines. So that tells you everything that's up here on the surface. What about in here? Anybody know? Yeah. Bingo, neutrinos, right? All right, so here's the fusion process in uh, all its glory, right? All you're basically doing is taking protons and turning that into helium uh, nucleus. But in, in you know, the process of doing that, you also produce uh, some other stuff like positrons, which don't make it very far because there's a lot of electrons around, so they collide with electrons or destroyed almost instantly. But you also make neutrinos. And so we can actually measure those neutrinos uh, from the sun. Very famous experiment back in the 60s. When was Ray's experiment? 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yeah, okay, it's a 20-year experiment. Uh, uh, that would actually that could actually detect neutrinos from fusion reactions inside the sun. Very one specific reaction. Uh, it turns out he couldn't he didn't actually see all of the neutrino reactions, about a third of them, and uh, that was sort of consternation for a little while until we realized that neutrinos actually change their flavor as they as they travel through space. So a little bit of particle physics uh, learned from the sun. But because we do see these neutrinos, we know for sure that the sun is fusing, which is good. Uh, because we don't have any other uh, you know, options for keeping the sun uh, at its rate uh, for a long period of time. Uh, but this is the process that actually generates uh, the energy we see. Right? About 27 million electron volts per reaction. It sounds like a lot, right? 27 million electron volts. Huge. Right? It, that would power a light bulb for about 10 to minus 13 seconds. So uh, you do a lot of these reactions for this to happen. Now, we know that stars are fusing, all right, not just because we can see these neutrinos, but also because of the periodic tables you mentioned. All right, this is what the uh, universe looked like before, or just after the Big Bang. I don't know what it looked like before the Big Bang. Uh, but just after the Big Bang, you've had basically three elements in the entire periodic table lying around. Very boring, all right, not a lot of food. Uh, and this is all the stuff that gets made into stars, so up to iron, not actually past iron, but up to iron. Yes, you got it. So, up to iron, you liberate some amount of energy as you go up this periodic table. Some amount of energy per nucleon. Once you get past that, then all of this other stuff 
you actually have to create a very massive explosion, supernova explosions of stars. Um, that's where all the sort of larger parts of the periodic table, because you can't extract energy in these reactions. You have to pour extra energy in. So not a good fuel source for stars if you have to put extra energy in. Um, anybody here have gold and silver jewelry on? Yeah. Star died for that. <laughs> you have, you're comfortable with that? Oh, okay. All right. All right, so so this is you know this is the job of stars, right? Everyone's got to have make a living somehow. This is what they do, right? They get a whole bunch of energy, but in the process they got to make all the elements in the periodic table. And thank goodness they do because we wouldn't be around if they didn't. And you can make hamburgers without stars, right? Because probably hamburgers are just normal things there, right? Uh, it depends on how what kind of um, antibiotics they put in the cattle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably stuff down here, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, organic hamburgers, maybe. Uh, and now, uh, and so that only happens because you have huge amount of heat inside the sun in the core, 15 million degrees Kelvin. You need that because this process, fundamentally, is taking positively charged things and making them stick together. And you know, from your electrostatics class, E and M class, you know that they don't like to do that. All right. So the only way you can make that happen is you get them so close together. Uh, that another force takes over the strong force. And that distance is something like the size of a nucleus, or so something like a femtometer, right? 10 to the minus 13 meters. That's how close you got to get these things together before they can, they can stick. And the electrostatic repulsion force at those distances are, is extremely huge. And so you need to have really high energies uh, to get them energetic enough, not, actually not to get over the electrostatic energy, but kind of tunnel through uh, that potential. And unfortunately, I don't have time to talk a lot about that. But if you want to learn more, take take. Do we have that in the class other than 160? OK, watch my lectures on 160 online. You can figure out more about that. All right. Um, OK, Jupiter, on the other hand, which is another big ball of gas made of hydrogen and helium mostly, uh, is not generating its own energy. It's not glowing, at least at the wavelengths that we can see with our eyes, uh, because the interior is just simply too cold. Again, we don't have a direct measure of this, but our models for what we think Jupiter's interior looks like puts it at something like 36,000 Kelvin, uh, which is pretty balmy and something that we can actually reproduce in the laboratory. And we're very sure that you can't have fusion in the laboratory at 36,000 Kelvin. So we're very sure that Jupiter is not currently fusing uh, elements, uh, at least enough to, to glow in its own energy. Um, it does glow, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. OK, let's do that. I don't think I need to go through that. That's my model of a star. Um, so we might ask why, so why did this turn out this way? What's that? Well, you got half, half the answer. So first question you can ask is, how, why is the sun so hot? Pressure. Pressure from what? Okay, gravitational pressure. So if I push on something, it makes it hot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not working. Yeah, but if I felt where your hand was, it would be warmer than the rest of the rest. Probably because of my hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. Uh, so gravity is part of it. What? What actually? What about gravity? Will make stars hot? Just pushing on the stars? I mean, there's nothing outside the star, right? There's nothing pushing outside. It's certainly got to be gravity that's pulling itself. Compressing gas. What's that? Compressing gas. So if this is the sun right now getting hotter because gravity is pushing on it? It doesn't have to like, maintain fusion to just keep collapsing on itself because it has like, force on it, so it's constantly. So, so today, yeah, so today fusion is pushing back. Actually, maybe I will do this little, little illustration. All right, so here's my model of, of the sun, right? A circle. It's very accurate. All right, it's about a light year across. So we're looking at the sun well before it's collapsed out to its current size, right? Light year is it's a huge distance, one quarter of the way to the nearest star. The current sun is much, much smaller than that, about 7 times 10 to the 8 meters in radius, right? Uh, so what happens? So I showed you those big pictures of those pillars of cloud, right? There were seven light years across, and out of that, that makes big stars. And so really what happens is gravity compresses, yeah, pressure. But more importantly, all of the gravitational energy, potential energy that was released in that process, right, all the stuff dropping stuff down and making sound, uh, 
happens at a much larger scale when you take something the mass of the sun and shrink it down to from a light year to the size of the sun. All right, so about half of that gravitational energy is goes into heating the core. About half of it's radiated away, so we can actually see it. Uh, and once you get to the point where you've put enough of that gravitational energy inside the center of the star, then you cross this threshold where you can start fusion reactions. And at that point, then, you've got this other source of pressure that can withhold the gravitational pull inwards and also provides all the energy that comes off the surface of the sun. Right? It takes a long time for the light to get out, but eventually does, and it emits radiation out. So we've got a system which is uh, in um, as a ne negative feedback system, right? If it tries to crush a little bit more, it gets a little bit hotter, nuclear reactions kick in further, and it pushes back. So it stays about the same size. Uh, if, you know, it radiates too much energy out here for whatever reason, it will, again, shrink a little bit, get hotter, and more energy will be produced. Right? So it stays in equilibrium. And that's great for us. This is, this is what we call the main sequence uh, stage for stars. And it's really good for life on planets because it takes a little while for life to develop on planets, like four billion years. And if we didn't have a stable star like the sun for that period of time, you know, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. Right? We need time to, to develop. So this is what happens for most stars. Right? They go from seven light years across to something the size of the sun. And with all that gravitational energy, they kickstart uh, fusion reactions. And then they're happy, go lucky, until they end up running out of fusion, which is about 10 billion years for our sun. Uh, now, if you have something that's smaller, right? so gravitational potential energy, uh, is gm squared over r, or proportional to this. There's some proportionality constant depending on the shape of your star and how the mass is concentrated. but Forgetting that little constant of order unity, we'll just throw that away. It depends on the mass square over the radius. And so the potential energy released per unit mass is proportional to the mass of the star and inversely proportional to the radius. And this is the important number because this is how much energy is given to each particle. Right? Mass of the star is like the number of particles times the mass of each particle. So however much energy I get from gravitation, this fraction, this, this ratio of it will go to each of each of the little particles in the sun. And so if I have something that's a tenth of the mass of the sun, for example, I'd have to shrink it down further. I have to make this number smaller to get to the same amount of potential energy gain, or the amount of heat I put into the, into the particles themselves. And so something like a tenth of the mass of the sun has to shrink down about a tenth of the size of the sun. And we see that when we look at stars of different masses, there's indeed this relationship between Small mass stars are small, and big mass stars are big, right? It's because they have to get small to get all the energy, or they, they don't have to shrink as much before they start fusion reactions. All right. So, you know, so how far can we take this, right? How, can we take a one hundredth the mass of the star sun, mass of the sun star, and shrink it to one hundredth the size of the sun? Can I take this remote control, which is about ten to the minus thirty-one the mass of the sun? and shrink it down to 10 to the minus 31 times the size of the sun and start fusion? It, it took a little while, but all right. <laughs> of course not. I'd be a millionaire. If, I'd be a bazillionaire if I could do that, right? All right. You don't have to mention the fact that it would be smaller. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. 10 to the minus 31 times the, ma the radius of the sun. I was like, the radius of the sun was about 10 to the 9 meters across in diameter. So 10 to the 31 times that is 10 to the, this is math, <laughs> 9 minus 31, 10 to the minus 22 meters. And what was a femtometer? 10 to the minus 13, which is the size of a nucleus of an atom. So we're eight, nine orders of magnitude below the size of an atom. Probably can't be done, right? So there must be a limit. Right? If I can't turn this into a sun, then there must be a limit to where there's some lower mass where you can't turn anything into a sun. Right? So that's, that's this question. How small can a star be? Uh, and the reason it comes out in degeneracy, right, the, uh, uh, quantum degeneracy, literally how much you can pack objects in. So this is subway degeneracy. Right? So you can only pack so many riders into a subway car. Right? Yeah, it's so it's just, but, <laughs> I know, it's dangerous. Bad. OK, I'm not going to look. Um, right, that's kind of sort of large-scale packing density degeneracy. 
not actually quite the same for quantum degeneracy. Quantum degeneracy is actually how well you pack energy, uh, how, much, how well you pack particles into energy states. And so when we talk about the state of a particle, it's everything you can use to describe you know, what that object is doing. So it's position in space, it's velocity through space. When we talk about quantum particles, we frequently use things like energy or spin, right, stuff like that. Uh, and so inside the sun, which is, again, very hot, right, most of the stuff is ionized, and the particles that we care about are the electrons. And when you start to compress all of these particles together as tightly as you can, you start running out of states where you can pack them, right? One of the great things about electrons, protons, and other nucleons is that uh, they are spin one-half particle, they're fermions, and you can't put two fermions in the same state and same place at the same time. That would, that's good because then we would just fall through the center of the Earth if that wasn't the case, so that would be bad. All right, so inside uh, really dense stars, remember you're taking something that you have to shrink even further to start fusion reactions. Uh, you get to this point where you've filled up all the energy states, and so these guys are happy and cold and just sitting there. The next state up, you've got to fill in, our, our, there's a minimum energy, so they start jiggling around, and then there's another minimum energy, and they start jiggling around. And finally, the, the particles that are the lowest energy ones that you can pack in, and you fill them into the lowest energy state they can be, it's still pretty high energy. So they're still bouncing around quite a bit. And all that bouncing around is a form of pressure. Right? They are pushing outwards because they are moving, bouncing, jiggling around, pushing on things. And so a degenerate gas is essentially one where you can't cool it off any further because there's simply no place for those electrons or protons or whatever particles you're talking about to go. Right? They are packed in as tightly as they can be. And they are packed in energy as tightly as they can be, which means there's still some that are very high energy. And so this uh, pressure pushing off is what we call degeneracy pressure. And ultimately, this is what sets the limit for how small a star can be, how much you can pack material down uh, before, it, before it stops drinking. So this was uh, examined back in the 1960s uh, by a guy named Shiv Kumar, who's still around. He's at the University of Virginia. Still thinks that these objects should be called Kumar dwarfs. I can email him for every once in a while. Um, and he and also another group in Japan, Hayashi Nakano, uh, basically asked this question, how tightly can you pack this? And so what this plot is showing is the density inside our star versus the temperature. And uh, the sense of these lines, which are different models of different masses, are over time these things shrink, so they get uh, denser, higher density, and higher temperature, because they're releasing gravitational potential energy. And so normal cells will just keep marching up here until they get to about 3 million Kelvin, which is kind of the threshold temperature roughly for fusion. And if they get to that point, then fusion kicks in and they're a star, and they're happy. But this other line here is the limit for degeneracy, right? the point where the electrons are packed so tightly that that's enough pressure to stop any sort of collapse of the star. And that point uh, is below this temperature for stars that are less massive than about 7% the mass of the sun. Okay? So, so, so that's a theory back in the 1960s. It predicted there's a minimum mass for a star, about 7% of the mass of the sun. And any objects that are lo less massive than that would shrink to about the size of Jupiter, it turns out. So this is sort of a model of what, what a brown dwarf would look like, that minimum mass star would look like. Uh, about the size of Jupiter, but more importantly, and by the way, it, it also would stay that way because gravity is still pushing in, but now degeneracy pressure is providing the support structure. So at least hydrostatically, it's in equilibrium. But it's not producing energy, or it's not transforming mass energy into to thermal energy. And so as it radiates away, these objects just cool off and disappear. Literally fade to black. Okay. Are you excited yet? Are these exciting objects? <laughs> See why they're exciting. Okay, so, so, so here's the you know, so here's the theory. 1960s, this was predicted, right? You'd have this population of things that were stars, but don't actually fuse anything, and because they don't fuse anything, they get really, really cold and they disappear and they're small. Why do I care? And uh, first of all, do they exist? Right? That's a good theory. Like we have lots of good theories that necessarily exist. Um, so, do they exist and why do we care? Well, here's why we should care. They're dark and they're made of stuff. Maybe they're dark matter. All right, now keep in mind, so here's, you know, here's our sort of uh, pie, pie plot of all the stuff in the universe, right? We're all this stuff, right? Ice cream, people, hamburgers, 4%. All right, and then all the rest of the stuff is stuff we don't know about. And stuff that gets Nobel Prizes, right? So 2011, dark energy, all right? The poster's just around here. Uh, got a Nobel Prize for recognizing that dark energy exists in the universe. 
turns out it's most of the stuff in the universe. Uh, but this one's still up for grabs. Yeah? And we've kind of known that dark matter is out there for quite a long time. Um, uh, Zwicky used to, uh, astronomer named Zwicky at, at Caltech, uh, proposed this way, way, way back because uh, he noticed that the galaxies were not rotating uh, as they should if the mass of the galaxy traced the light that you see in the galaxy. Remember, stars are light. Stars are mass. And so if you see light, that must be the mass of the galaxy. And it turned out that's not the case. There's all this other mass that's there that's not seen. Okay? So we'll call so it dark. Give yeah. Give a 10-minute warning, and we've got this thing to do. And Thank you. We have more questions. Okay. All right, so that's still up for grabs. So maybe they're ground bores. So maybe we should look for them. So another good reason to look for them is this is a picture of, uh, of just a small chunk of space, about one degree on the side from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, and while the lights are not great in here, what are the sort of typical colors of the stars that you see in this picture? Yellow, red, orange. Yellow, red, orange. A couple of blues. Like there's a lot of these like red, very red things and, and orange things. You know, the really faint stuff all looks white, so it's kind of hard to tell. The things that you can see that are close that have color seem to be slightly more often red than blue. Now, you should have a little card in front of you if you don't see the star master there. All right, on these cards, there these are all stars that were within about uh, 20 light years of the sun. Uh, it's a random sample to the point where they've all been picked up unless you chose your star because you liked it. Um, and uh, so those of you who have the most massive stars, which are O, B, and A stars, raise your hands. Oh, quite a few. All right, four, four O, B, or A stars. All right, if you have a uh, F, G, or K star, which are all sun-like stars, raise your hand. Quite a few. Oh, I think statistically this is not going to be right. Okay. If you do, if you have an M star, raise your hand. All right. Small number statistics. So normally when I do this, <laughs> most of you are M stars, so apparently I'm at the bottom of my stack. Um, if you're a brown dwarf, raise your hand. A couple of you. Okay. Congratulations. Um, if you're a white dwarf, raise your hand. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So what we usually find out, so so experiment didn't quite work out, but what we should find out is that 70% of you should have raised your hand if you're an M-dwarf, so my sample's a little bit off. 70% uh, of the stars in the solar neighborhood are the smallest stars that we know, all right? Things that are a tenth the mass, a tenth the size of the sun, all right? Everything else is every other type of star, sun-like stars, really massive stars, something like that. 70% of the stars are really tiny stars. And if you plot that on a diagram like Edwin Selkir did back in 1955, this is showing uh, the number density of stars in log scale, so every step is factor 10, versus the mass of the stars where the low mass things are over here and the high mass things are over here, this scale just keeps going up as you go to lower and lower masses. That's back in 1955. So, you know, brown dwarfs are thought about in the 1960s. They look at the spot and say, well, I wonder how far that line goes. Astronomers love to keep drawing lines. You know, who knows? If that line kept going all the way down to a Jupiter mass, that about a hundredth the mass of the sun, sorry, a thousandth the mass of the sun, uh, that would make up all of the dark matter. And you'd get a Nobel Prize. All right? Sounds good. So let's go look for them. Well, it took uh, a while. None, none. Ooh, we got one in the 80s. Turned out it was a glint on a telescope. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> so 30 years, no one found any brown dwarfs. And... Um, the reason is, as I told you, as I told you before, these things, because they don't produce energy, they just radiate all of their heat away, so they cool off over time. And in order to see cool things, you've got to look at longer wavelengths. So some, hopefully some of you have seen these sort of black body curves distributions. This is the photon distribution, a uh, uh, Bose-Einstein photon distribution for light, but it's just the wavelengths that we see light coming out of. Um, so if you're something like the sun, that peaks somewhere in the visible range, right? Fortunately, somewhere around yellow. Just kind of what the sun looks like. Uh, if you're a lower mass star, it peaks actually outside the visible range, but you see a little bit of the light, which all comes out in the red, right? That's why they're cool red stars. If you're down here, where we think many of the brown dwarfs are, about 600 Kelvin, right? None of the light comes out in the visible. They're invisible. So you didn't. People didn't see them because they weren't there. They didn't see them because because they weren't visible, right? They're there, but they're invisible. And so it required the, the development of imaging uh, technology in infrared. This is an infrared detector 
Uh, this is about uh, 2K by 2K, so by your camera standards, it's, it's pathetically small, right? But that costs about half a million dollars. I've held one, it's very scary. Uh, and we put these things in instruments, and we put those on telescopes, and lo and behold, we start to find brown dwarfs. So I think because of time, I'm going to skip this one. Um, and I will just say that, so starting in the 19... 90s, 1995 to be in particular, so right about when I was graduating. Uh, this is the first brown dwarf that was found. It's actually a companion to a nearby star, which is called Gliese 229, uh, which is the 229th star in the Gliese catalog. Serious name. Uh, and this is Gliese 229b, because it's secondary. Uh, this looks like a really big, bright star, but it turns out this is one of those little stars, those M-type stars. But it's just so oversaturated, so we can see this little faint thing. That's why it looks massive. This is actually a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, the amazing thing, when they, so they, they saw this little thing thing, and they said, oh, I wonder what that is. Let's take a spectrum of it. This is, these are spectra, so breaking up the light is a function of wavelength. And this is a spectrum in the near infrared where they emit a lot of light. This is that Lisa 229b object right here. And this is the spectrum of this thing, which is Titan, which is a moon in Saturn. So we discovered a moon <laughs> around a star. Not quite, because this is actually much warmer. This turns out to be about 1,000 Kelvin at surface. But it's cold enough to have stuff like methane in its atmosphere, stuff that we never see in stars, that we only see in planets, right? Because it's only in planetary atmospheres that it's cold enough to have molecules of these kinds uh, in, in them. And so today, we've now got literally uh, thousands of these things. This is a web page that I maintain with a, with a friend of mine at Caltech, uh, where we've got lists of what we now, these are new letters for spectrotypes. I don't have time to talk about spectrotypes too much, but these are other letters that aren't on your things. Um, but these are new classes of stars that we've discovered. Uh, and they're based uh, on the fact that they have different looking spectra. And uh, we're starting to find all sorts of really cool things. And so, uh, and we're still finding lots of stuff. So just this last year, uh, we found this star. Now remember I said the ancient Greeks called planets things that moved and stars stayed the same place? Well, here's the thing that's moving across the sky. Uh, it's moving much less than we would be able to see with our eyes, but it's certainly moving quite a lot compared to other stars in this image. And because it's, it's doing that because it's so nearby, it's only about uh, six light years away, right? Two parsecs of astronomers talk. Uh, it's the third closest system to our sun. It's actually the nearest system to Alpha Centauri, so we found their neighbor. I don't know if they know that. Uh, and we just found this early this year, and it's, and it's a pair of brown dwarfs that we had never seen before. So we're finding all sorts of new things like that. Uh, we're finding things that are so cold that they're not just invisible, but they're in infraredible. So we can't even see them at infrared wavelengths. We have to go out to longer wavelengths to colder temperatures. Uh, this is a, another, see this two images taken side by side. Uh, this is a known star. It's a white dwarf. This is its very cold companion, and it's so cold, it's about 300 Kelvin. Anybody know what the temperature in the room is? Yeah. About that. So this is a star that's a room temperature or body temperature star. Let's go. We could. Uh, there's no place to stand. That's the only problem. And we like to stand or sit. Uh, can't do that on these kind of things. Um, we're finding planets that we're not quite sure if we call them planets or not. This is a little companion uh, to another pair of stars that's nearby. Uh, and this distance, 1100 AU, is about 1100 times the distance between the sun and the Earth. And it's about 200 times bigger than our solar system. We have no idea how you can form a planet out here. Remember I showed that picture of a disk? That's where the planets are coming out of. Disks don't ever get this big. So we're not sure if this thing started a disk and maybe got kicked out, or maybe this is a new way of forming planets that doesn't involve a disk. Uh, we don't really know. But this is also something that's, that's very cool and only about seven times the mass of Jupiter. So it's very low mass, right in the planetary mass range. Uh, this little sort of graphic-y kind of thing shows pictures of various objects that we see in a cluster called Sigma Orionis, a very young cluster of stars. And those objects that we, we estimate their masses are around a few Jupiter masses. But they're not orbiting anything. All the planets we look at orbit stars because they form from the stuff around stars. These things aren't orbiting stars. Where did they come from? Did they form around stars and get kicked out? Or did they form in some other way that we don't know? And so... Um, I don't time that. So I think the thing, what we're finding now is that 
as we look for more of these objects, and actually this is still going on. And we, we started finding the first one in 1995. It's about 20 years ago. We, as I mentioned, we're still finding all sorts of new systems, new spectral types, new types of atmospheres, new things going on in their atmospheres. Um, this gap is definitely being bridged by these things called brown dwarfs, but we're learning that maybe it's not a gap at all. Maybe there's sort of a continuum of things here. Maybe there are brown dwarfs that form like Jupiter, but get kicked out. Maybe there are things that form like stars, but are just so mass that they look more like these objects. There's a lot more of a sort of blend here than we had expected there would be even 20 years ago, and thousands of years ago, of course. And so we see this theme in astronomy a lot, and I just want to emphasize that, that we like to classify things as humans because it reduces our uh, cognitive load, right? We don't have to think about stuff as much as if we can just put them in little nice little boxes. Um, but nature doesn't work that way, right? Nature doesn't like boxes. It makes all sorts of stuff. And so, you know, as you're doing physics or as you're doing whatever science, think about how your classification themes might actually be holding you back because there may be other stuff out there that, that you wouldn't expect. And I'll take any questions you have. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good question. So, uh, how do I know where to point? So, um, I either point to. So, most of these objects are found in surveys. So, I'll show a picture of these. So, I mentioned that um, you have to look in the near infrared to find these things. And there are now a whole bunch of survey or missions that have been imaging the entire sky at those wavelengths, so we think brown dwarfs are the brightest. So, uh, so IRAS was an old one, didn't find any brown dwarfs, it's not very useful. Uh, but 2 mass is the one that was operating back when I was a graduate student, so this is the one that I worked with to find the brown dwarfs I was looking at. Uh, and now there's another survey called WISE where all these really cold things are being found. Um, and so what we do is we, you know, there's kind of literally billions of stars, and then they have all these sort of different measurements for how bright they are, different wavelengths, where they are in the sky, whether they're moving across the sky, which means they're nearby. Uh, and we use all that data to basically sift through and find the 110 objects that you're interested in. This is anyone who's doing using catalogs to find high redshift quasars or nearby brown dwarfs or pouring old stars. All right, they use these different catalogs to find those objects. Well, the catalogs, so the, the folks that make these catalogs, so they just get images, and then they, they have sort of software to select out the bright things on them and measure, make, make these measurements, and then they produce literally a table of, of data on each of these sources. And then we go to the telescope, and typically what I do is I'll, I do spectroscopy. So I'll, I'll point to the star particularly in infrared, I'll take an infrared spectrum of it, break up its light, and try to see, based on the pattern of its features, whether it's one of the objects that I'm looking for, right? It has a characteristic shape based on what's absorbing uh, light out of the atmosphere. Um, or it might be something completely new, and then i got to figure out what it is. So I mostly do spectroscopy, uh, and I mostly will either look at catalogs or look at things that people already know, and I'm looking at a different wavelength to study it more detail. Yeah. So I hope there will be some more questions, but we are over time, so you have to go. Is that clock not right? Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, 350 is when we found only the end box. Oh. Um, so, like, a brown dwarf is made because it goes through the normal process the star goes through, but it doesn't end up having enough mass to cross that threshold. Yeah, then, exactly. Um, but why, and why wouldn't they, why do they disappear? Like, if there's enough gravitational energy to bring them together until, like, it matches the degeneracy pressure pushing outwards. Why does it then? Oh, they don't disappear. So they're still there. Oh, I'm but they so they radiate their energy away, right? So they get cold and dark. So they disappear from our view. But they're still there. Yeah, sorry. So I've been confused. They're still there. They don't go anywhere. In fact, you know, come back, you know, a hundred times the age of the universe from now, there'll be brown dwarfs everywhere and nothing else. Because everything else will be just dispersed all over the place. But the brown dwarfs will all be there. And then we got a job. Yeah. So I'm following you with the dark matter maybe being these brown dwarfs and things like that. Um, like, at what point is that, like, what are you doing to try to, to prove that if that's what you think? And then at what point does that become proven? So like, what, what do we need to do so to say that? So, they're not. Okay. <laughs> so we already know, based on counting the objects that we have today, that the number of brown dwarfs is probably about the same number of stars, which is still, you know, we just found double the size of the galaxy in terms of star-like things, which is pretty big. 
but because they're all low mass things, uh, they don't add up to make up the amount of mass that you actually need to make stars. So that, that ship has sailed. No Nobel Prize for dark matter from brown dwarfs. There may be other things that happen exciting me for brown dwarfs, but at least in terms of dark matter, we have to look for other, other options. So, you know, uh, Professor Grice is looking for asteroid size black holes, remnant black holes, you know. A lot of people here are looking for particle that might be related to dark matter. But actually, you know, one thing that we do know from other uh, experiments is that the dark matter isn't anything that's on the periodic table. It's not made of about baryonic matter. It's yeah. not made of uh, normal atoms. So it would have to be something where you just can't point this off the jet. Yeah, I mean, brown dwarfs is the easy option. Because if it was, it was brown dwarfs, it's baryonic matter, then you don't have to hypothesize a new type of matter. But that seems to be the case, that it's something totally different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keeps things exciting, yeah. So it seems like uh, one of the things was about the same spectrum as the brown dwarf. Yeah. So is that an hypothesis to the formation of the brown dwarf? Well, it's, it's actually a little coincidental, because uh, Titan is only about 90 Kelvin at its surface. It's actually not. It's actually, it's actually the perfect temperature for liquid gas, which there it's all there are lakes all over Titan of liquid, like you know, hydrocarbons. Um, but uh, the brown dwarf is a thousand Kelvin and has no surface. And so the reason they look the same is is just because they have that one similar molecule, which is methane, in both their atmospheres. Um, so we all you know we see we see things like water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, dirt. We see dirt in the atmospheres of brown dwarfs. All right. Um, uh, and that's just chemically, that's what forms in their atmospheres. It doesn't mean that there's land or, or what it's necessarily hospitable, uh, but that's just the chemistry of their atmospheres. Yeah. So it's a little coincidental. It's not that there, it's a moon per se, it's just that it has the same stuff in its atmosphere. Yeah. So they're brown because there never is a fusion reaction, right? They're brown because they never fuse? Uh, or do they actually, it, there will not be a fusion reaction, so that makes them dark. Yeah. What stops them from just going like really, like, why can't they like form a thesis? They they fill gas form, right? Mm -hmm. Why why don't they go solid like planets do? Oh, that's a good question. We think so. You know, we're talking about hydrogen, and helium, in, in pressures that is absolutely impossible to measure here on Earth, and so guessing what the state of that matter would be is 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 that it's a guess. Uh, there are theories to sort of predict that at some point hydrogen will start to crystallize, so it might that's kind of a solid. We know that it's probably metallic at these pressures, um, which means it conducts electricity just like just like a metal. Um, but it's still a fluid, so it still moves. So um, you know this this is where this is really where our understanding of what this what brown dwarfs are made of, at least in the inside, is is sort of hits a limit because they're at such extreme conditions. Uh, that there's no way we can do a laboratory experiment to say, ah, okay, that's what hydrogen does at this pressure regime. So a lot of it's just theory to tell us, I think this is what hydrogen does when it's at, you know, 10 billion times the pressure of, of the insides of Jupiter. Uh, and that should predict, like, a radius of such a size, and so that's one thing we can actually measure. But whether it's solid or something else, is a, it's a much more difficult question. Yeah. yeah. Is it that they emit... Uh, infrared light, or is it the incident light gets reflected in it to the infrared range? So, so you emit infrared light. So if I had infrared eyes, you'd be bright. Yeah. Right? Everything would be very really bright in here. Okay? So they, they are thermally emitting objects. Anything that has a temperature is emitting oh, some right. kind of radiation. Yeah. And in most of these objects I showed you, don't, they're not orbiting anything. So there's nothing really to reflect. They're just emitting their own light. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Bad acts, but, like, you, hey. Like, <laughs> what do you do? Do you, you find yourself like getting bogged down, but like, you're so far away, and like, do you just end up feeling like you're getting like, or do you like? Is there a constant your mind? You're like, oh yeah, I am doing this. That's this is a deep <laughs> philosophical question. Um, you know, I like data. You know, data is measurement. Data is truth. D data is something that. Um, you know, challenges ideas. So I like to reduce data. Uh, so I don't feel ever bogged down in that. Uh, but I think as a as a scientist, you should always be thinking about what is the what are the higher questions I'm asking. 
you know, what what is the actual sort of thing? I'm because it is easy just to think, okay, I'm going to get involved in like programming and coding and figure out the best kind of data reduction package that's possible, and it's going to be like amazing. I'm going to spend ten years doing it, and they have no idea what you did it for, right? So it's always good to keep the big questions in mind, um, but that doesn't mean you can't have fun with data. You do both. You know, one thing I'll point out is that when you're doing astrophysics, even if the stuff that you're studying is very remote, um, in some sense, it's the most universal universe. But uh, you know, let's say you're you're reading an astronomical sort of um, newsletter or something, and there's a supernova in a galaxy far away. Okay, um, somebody on a planet on the other side of this galaxy is reading the same thing. <laughs> the only news we have in common. Everything that's in the universe. So you're studying something much bigger than humanity, something that is uh, reaching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what kind of, you said that you have uh, some undergrads at the Cool Star Lab. Yeah. What kind of stuff are they doing? So um, right now, so I've had I've had a couple undergrads work on variability, so looking at stars that, that vary over time, and that can be related to uh, one thing I didn't get to mention was that they these stars have weather on them, they have clouds, they have you know stormy days and not stormy days, and so we can infer that based on how they change in brightness over time. Um, so I've had some students that mark that. Um, I have one student right now that's working on a pair of very young low-mass stars that are newly formed and have really thick disks around them, so we don't actually see the stars. We see the stars in reflection. Uh, and those are also highly variable, so trying to piece together what we see when it's really bright versus what we see when it's really faint, and what that tells us about the star and the gas around it. That's another topic. Um, lots of stuff. Yeah. Radio observations, we have radio observations that we work on. A lot to do. Um, can you just like check out the website and is there like an application process on there? Or should we talk to you at another time? Uh, you should talk to me. You just send me an email. Okay. Talk to me. Um, yeah, talk to me. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little more to like the correlation between particle physics and astrophysics? And you're studying data by looking at the stars but then analyzing it on like a particle physics sort of perspective because you want to know what's happening internally? Or? Well, so, you know, the amazing thing about stars, uh, and I encourage everyone to take Physics 160, uh, because we do all physics when we look at a star, right? So, like, you know, what happens in terms of energy generation is nuclear and particle physics. What happens in terms of how the energy gets out to the surface is all thermo, you know, statistical physics. Uh, you know, what happens when we look at the star and the spectrum we see is all, you know, optics, radi radiation physics. Uh, there's E and M in there, and there's magnetic fields, you know, there's a lot of sort of gravitational energy stuff you go with. So there's like every possible thing in physics you can talk about is contained in a star. And that's why I, th I think it's one of the most amazing objects in the universe, because it does contain everything you could possibly think of. Um, but does this one simple thing, it make elements, right? That's all it does. Um, so simple. So simple, yeah. Um, I'm not sure I remember what your question is now. <laughs> oh, what particle, particle, particle perspective? I mean, you do because um, um, you know you have in order to understand how these things evolve in time. You have to understand ultimately what's powering them, and that comes from the physics of the very small. Um, so there's all these kind of there are very frequently these kind of connections where you're looking. I mean, especially astronomy, you're looking at like you know humongous. Galaxies, and you're worrying about like dark matter particles, right? But that's what controls the dynamics of the galaxies. Is this one mysterious particle that we can't find yet? Yeah, there's an astrophysicist. Do you ever do particle physics experiments? Oh no, I got too much in my head. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so but I, you know, when I was an undergrad, I did a particle physics experiment when I was here. So. Yeah. Okay, it's okay to do. Uh, that's a good question. So it's probably true. Yeah, we don't know, right? So it's it's all we know is that the universe is expanding and it's accelerating its expansion, and there's something causing that. Is that that was that the answer? Without we don't even know that. We don't know because that acceleration is inferred on a backdrop of general relativity. What if we don't understand large scale gravity and cosmic scales? Yeah. So there are explanations that show this. Apparent acceleration is just a modification of the 
So if you showed that was true, that Dark Energy is wrong, would they take the Nobel Prize away from the other guy who came to you? No. They might give you a new one. I don't know. But they probably wouldn't take theirs back. Yeah. <laughs> Erase it out of the <laughs> Are there other, are there Nobel Prizes that have been given for things that are just blatantly wrong? I'm not sure. That's a good question. I mean, the, the real question is, were any of those things published in the publication Nature? Because if so, they were Fifty percent chance they were right. right. <laughs> um, no, but I think I think you know that Nobel Prize would still stand as showing that there was a mystery in the universe and that there is this apparent acceleration. Uh, it's not really a Nobel Prize for stating dark energy as much as mm -hmm. showing that yeah. there's some anomaly in the universe. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the technique to actually have made that measurement was was very complex. I mean, it took decades to figure out how to. I mean, so the you know the basic measurements they were looking at supernova at very large distances, and you can measure both how the supernova receding from you, which when we look out in the universe, most of the stuff is receding from us because the universe is expanding, uh, and they can also get an independent measure of the distance based on how bright the supernova is. And when they compare those two numbers, they don't uh, line up with the sort of linear relation of how the universe would just be expanding. So there was some kink in that relation. Um, but to do that, you'd have you have to know very precisely how bright supernovae are. There's all sorts of things that are in the way of looking at that star, especially when they're really far away. So you have to take that. There's a lot of stuff you have to be careful about. So it took many decades to to get to the point where you could say there's something really wrong here, and that's worth the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, uh, we have to go back to the cosmic microwave background and anisotropy in the universe, probably, for that answer. Uh, it's, it's sort of like your second answer, though. You have randomness, and things come together. The chances that you have zero in the moment uh, vanishingly small. Yeah. So big, complex simulations, computational simulations, starting from seed fluctuations in the density of the universe, and you just turn that back on a crank, you can get rotating galaxies. I mean, it's if you know, if I, I don't have any water here, but you know, if I look at individual particles of water in a water bottle, there'll be some net, you know, angular momentum between them. But the average, sure, why not? But the average of, you know. 10 to the 24 particles in there is going to be zero, right? So the average over the entire universe is hopefully zero angular momentum, although that's a, that's a good question. Uh, but locally, you know, locally you can get things that are spinning in different directions. Uh, when yeah. is that course you were talking about, Rule 60? Yes, fall. When? Fall. Yeah. yeah. I won't be here next time. <laughs> you, can, you can watch them online. They're on YouTube. Any other questions? OK. Thank you very much. Oh, one last one. Uh, would you like to keep them? You can keep them. <laughs> I know. People only keep this. Well, in that case, they only keep the M-dwarfs, which is very interesting. If you don't want to keep them, please bring them back, because they're, I want to see how bad the statistics skew.